All right, guys. Well, welcome back. I appreciate you sticking with me. Are you ready for the second Peruvian plunge? We have uh, wrapped up our little two-week interlude in the big city of Cusco, and we are now ready to get back to the Amazon jungle for plunge number two, which we're going to kick off with a line... <clears throat> from a famous blues song, Doomsday Stoner Blues, by some guy named Hambone Littletail. Little boy blue, come blow your horn, Exxon's in the jungle, Monsanto's in the corn. Thank you, Hambone Littletail. And that will bring us to chapter 21 back in the arms of the Mother of God. And we're going to check in with Greenpeace before heading back to the jungle. <clears throat> At the World Social Forum in Belém, in the heart of the Amazon, we've released evidence confirming cattle ranching to be the biggest driver of Amazon deforestation. Greenpeace Brazil has, has produced a series of maps which show in greater detail than ever before the direct links between cattle ranching and forest destruction in the Amazon. <clears throat> between 1990 and 2003, Brazil's cattle herd more than doubled from 26 million to 64 million head of cattle, and I'm sure it's doubled again at least. This is the reason I do not eat beef. Anyway, picking back up on the road from Cusco to Atalaya, it is now Saturday. It is the 4th of July, 2009. All right, the 4th of July. <clears throat> Take it away. On my second plunge into the Peruvian Amazon, I rolled into the arms of the Mother of God astride a toilet paper throne on the 4th of July, symbolically celebrating my revolution in consciousness of wiping the shit stain of big oil from the rainforest. Nine hours and 45 minutes into our 10-hour bus ride from Cusco, our city slicker young driver had underestimated the bus-eating power of a jungle pothole. This slight misadjustment had left our shiny new tour bus stranded on the side of the muddy jungle track with an ugly green snake of antifreeze oozing from the bottom of a ruptured radiator and winding its way into a roadside stream. <clears throat> the dozen other passengers, nearly all of them about half my age, had bounded out of the bus like a pack of frisky puppies and headed down the road with their meager bundles of possessions, welcoming the misadventure as if it were all just part and parcel of the great Amazonian experience. <clears throat> a lot older and a little bit wiser, I had elected to remain on the sidelined tourist bus reading A Confederacy of Dunces for the umpteenth time and keeping watch over my two bags of cannonballs. An experienced traveler on the muddy spiritual path, I was safe for the knowledge that, even if Spirit did not send a truck to rescue my ass, that the bus from Pilcapatha would be coming down the road sooner or later. <clears throat> Just as I had figured, my salvation bound for Salvacion had come rolling around the bend just before I'd had time to read two pages of Dunce's, the Pulitzer Prize-winning novel and single greatest book ever written by the late John Kennedy Toole, who had blown his brains out after failing to find anyone to publish <clears throat> his masterpiece. I flagged down the truck, hoisted my two heavy bags of cannonballs, and my computer which was miraculously still alive after six months on this long, strange trip, into the back and pulled myself in after them. 
I was delighted to find the truck was making the local toilet paper run, which, considering my adventure leaving the Amazon 16 days earlier, was somehow poetic, not to mention quite comfortable in its symmetry. Until the unfortunate run-in with a cantankerous pothole, the day's adventure had been, compared to my first terrifying trip across the Andes on a narrow llama trail, downright uneventful and borderline relaxing even. We had pulled out of Cusco at the crack of dawn in a shiny new 16-seater gringo tour bus. From Cusco, we had taken a spectacular sunrise cruise down a smooth paved highway to the Sacred Valley, rolled on through Pisac where the pavement ended, and continued on to Puerto Combo along a perfectly nice gravel highway. What all that ridiculous drama I had been subjected to on the terrifying llama trail to Puerto Combo from the other direction the first time out will be forever shrouded in unfathomable Peruvian mystery. Pardon the arrogant gringo snobbery here, guys, but apparently it was simply the difference between having a Peruvian plan a trip and having a gringo plan the same trip. There. I said it. Okay? <clears throat> After a long, leisurely breakfast stop in the high mountain town of Puerto Combo, we had journeyed up and over Tres Cruces Pass, where I was relieved to see a knuckle-biting landslide from my previous journey had been patched. From there, we had plunged downhill in style and comfort into the cloud forest, capping the highest ridges of the crown jewel of Peru's national park system, the Vermont-sized Manu National Park, and wound our way down the mountain into the steamy, to the steamy and logged out lowland rainforest around Pilcapatha, where I purchased one of the ubiquitous bright blue plastic tarps favored by the local squatters. I had just uttered the fate-tempting words, we should be in Atalaya, our destination, in 15 minutes when we slammed into the pothole and ground to a halt. <clears throat> I was settled onto my comfortable toilet paper throne and soaking in the jungle scenery and general vibe, just downshifting my gears from 16 days of hectic partying in the city <clears throat> when we overtook the pack of frisky youngsters. There was barely enough room on the overloaded truck for one more body, the coveted spare seat was awarded to the eldest member of the pack of pedestrians, a mysterious 30-something attractive green-eyed redhead we had picked up in Pisac. I was certain she was not part of the gang of other travelers, a group calling themselves Green Empowerment, visiting Manu Learning Center for a three-day workshop on alternative energy sources for small rural towns. But past that, I could not figure her out. She was clearly at least the child of gringo breeding. <clears throat> However, she was so fluent in her rapid-fire, unintelligible Spanish, I never heard her utter one word of English the entire day, even when she was addressing gringos, that I finally just accepted the obvious fact that she was a freckle-faced, red-haired, green-eyed Peruvian. If you're wondering why I had never introduced myself to her during the course of the day, I must remind you that I am a painfully shy, socially awkward hermit, and a celibate one at that, who speaks little Spanish, so I simply did not have the balls required to bridge the mile-wide chasm that separated me from her. Therefore, when she introduced herself to me and her thick Alabama drawl, I nearly 
fell off my throne of toilet paper. I mean, I was every bit as flabbergasted as McMurphy and one flew over the cuckoo's nest when the mute big chief uttered the famous line, Juicy Fruit. Since I was too shy to ask the tall, willowy redhead what in her life had brought her to be sitting on a stack of toilet paper in the back of a truck rolling through the Amazon jungle on the 4th of July, Patrice, People are weird about me using their real names, but who am I to talk? Beat me to the beat me to the punch. The words Hunt Oil Company had barely escaped my lips before my truck mate let loose with a barrage of animated but good-natured vitriol against the evil gang of invading planet eaters. Said Patrice. They say there's a sacred rock back there in the jungle where Hunt was ready to invade. That seems to you, she said. My new sister-in-arms had written half of Peruvian plunge for me before the truck had taken its final plunge into the village of Atalaya, Spanish for watchtower, and spit us out on the banks of my long-lost friend, the Mother of God River. We would have to continue our lively discussion about Hunt Oil later. At that moment, we had a boat to catch. <clears throat> the pack of green-empowered puppies, looking a little less frisky after their half-hour hike through the hot, sticky jungle under the weight of their backpacks, carefully negotiated their way down the steep stairway of Atalaya's little dock each of them carrying sweaty little plastic bottles of water. We all piled into the comfortable tourist boat and waited for the young captain to finish loading the groceries that would sustain us for the next week. So, how goes your first day in the jungle? I asked the young woman in the seat next to me who was rolling her perspiring little plastic bottle over her equally perspiring face. Okay, I guess, she said, but I keep seeing all that bright green antifreeze pouring out from under that bus heading straight into that little creek. Here we are out to save the rainforest with all these alternative energy ideas. Here she paused to take a swig out of her plastic bottle that had been chilled in Atalaya's coolest refrigerator. And... We haven't even been here for 10 minutes before what happens? We pour antifreeze into a creek. Doesn't that stuff like kill your dog if he drinks one swallow of it? Further conversation was shattered by the cough of the 60 horsepower gasoline outboard motor that, they, that we were depending on to get us two miles down the fast flowing river setting off amid a pungent cloud of blue smoke the green empowered students and i headed off down the brown muddy waters of the muddy of mother of god we hadn't been on the water two minutes when all the stress of 16 days of hectic cusco city life began to melt away somehow i guess the stress had snuck up on me when i hadn't been paying attention and like the song of a songbird at sunrise, I hadn't even realized it was there until it was gone. Ah, now this is the way to knock back a Saturday afternoon on the 4th of July, I thought, leaning back in my comfortable padded seat. Off to my left, the rolling, crumpled, forest-shrouded hills flowed away into the safe haven of Manu National Park perhaps the last place in the Peruvian Amazon that planet eaters are not allowed to tread, whether they be oil companies or airport developers. And off to my right, stretching eastward for 80 jungle-covered miles, the equally remote and mysterious million-acre off-the-tourist-track wilderness of Amaracari. Little did I realize as we chugged down the river under the glorious golden light of the setting sun that the planet eaters 
were already beginning to gather in salvation. <clears throat> I was just beginning to settle into the groove of the river when much too quickly, thanks to that 60-horse motor, we came to rest on a rocky crescent of beach at the bottom of the steep left-hand riverbank, thinking I would be living at my new learning center for at least a month and possibly three months to even a year, I had packed all of my remaining possessions along with me. Now the embarrassed owner of the two bags, the two bags of cannonballs, I began the arduous climb up two flights of slippery wooden stairs, which opened into a long rock-lined runway through the forest of perhaps 200 feet. I was huffing and puffing like a bulldog on a treadmill when the path emerged from the woods into a grassy field of perhaps an acre. The back half of the forest clearing was ringed by five attractive wooden buildings with thatched palm roofs. It seems the only buildings left in the Peruvian Amazon with palm roofs anymore are in the eco-lodges and research stations. <clears throat> the long, low-slung dining room and lounge stretched along the path to my left, and the spotlessly clean community bathrooms were straight ahead, and the balance of the field was ringed by three big two-story communal dormitories. The kindly staff person directed me to my bed on the second story of the bunkhouse in the back left corner. Somehow I found the strength to drag my two bags of cannonballs up the steep wooden stairway. My home for the foreseeable future was a single bed in a large open co-ed bedroom with seven roommates. There were no petitions or even curtains between the beds for privacy. The only privacy was provided by the tight weave of the mosquito netting. I shoved away a fleeting vision of my beloved little boa cabin with its end-of-the-road privacy and hot showers and wondered what the hell was I doing again with my life. Clearly, my bedroom was exactly that and nothing more. A big room full of beds where I would retire at night and abandon in the morning. Any hope of personal space so critical to my new life as a writer would have to be carved out elsewhere on the grounds. In an effort to do just that, I set out toward the river of the dying light of day's end. I was thrilled to find a wooden gazebo perched atop the riverbank affording a lovely view over the Mother of God and towards the east, over the hills of Amaracari, where Hunt Oil Company would soon be blowing off 12,000 sticks of dynamite. Perhaps 30 feet in diameter, the gazebo held three hammocks. Wishing I had a joint or even a piña colada, either one of which would have gotten me kicked out from my new vice-free home, I reclined in a hammock to enjoy the view of the swelling moon three days out from full. I was disappointed to hear someone else arriving, but was pleasantly surprised to find that someone else was my former truck mate <clears throat> of the toilet paper throne, Patrice. We cranked up our earlier conversation and I began to fill in the blanks of our aborted discussion. This is Patrice's Peruvian plunge story in a nutshell. Patrice had been living in Peru for almost a decade, scrimping by as an eco-tour guide, and for the past several years, surprise, surprise, as an ayahuasquera in training. When Patrice mentioned this, one day after my visit to Casa de Serenidad, spirit swooped in over my left shoulder and silenced me with a timeout signal, which I wisely obeyed. 
she made sure I understood that her type of ayahuasca healing was just that, healing from specific complaints and not the more general form of what she calls mystical tourism. If anything, she is more outraged about that whole bullshit, rampant rage sweeping Peru than I am. <clears throat> Patrice was visiting Manu Learning Center to hook up with her boyfriend, Ramon, a genuine Harambut native from the village of Shintuya, who had been recommended to me as a possible guide into Amarakari. <clears throat> Ramon, his girlfriend explained, came from a long line of native ayahuasca shamans, but, lo but like so many of his modern generation, he had drifted from the path of the vine of the souls. And the greatest re role reversal since Mr. Ed and Wilbur Post, the green-eyed, red-headed ayahuasca from Alabama was was coaching the son of a son of a shaman from the Peruvian Amazon to rekindle the lost but still latent talent. And by all reports, I hear he is progressing rapidly in rediscovering the lost art. Only on the banks of the Mother of God River in the Peruvian Amazon can you find such touching true life tales of romance. Perhaps I'll still sell the story to Harlequin. What do you think? Dinner time was at 7 p.m., so Patrice and I returned to the dining room. <laughs> this long, narrow room, consisting of two long dining tables in the center, had and capped by clumps of comfortable couches and easy chairs was the beehive and social center of Manu Learning Center. In the dim glow of candlelight, I tried to figure out the societal structure of this semi-anarchistic commune I had stumbled into alone. Group one was the visitors to the lodge, mostly researchers and or university students staying at the research center for several days to several weeks. The Green Empowerment Gang formed the nucleus of this group. Next in the pecking order were the volunteers, who I suspect and assume were paying quite a bit of money for the life-enriching and resume-building honor of working for Crease. In nine days of living at Manu Learning Center, I never did get a proper headcount, though I would estimate they numbered about a dozen young 20-something idealists who somehow had found their way to this remote jungle outpost in the Peruvian Amazon from such far-flung parts of the world as at least England, Ireland, Germany, and California. I could not imagine that such a diverse group had known each other before washing up on the banks of the Mother of God, but by the time I arrived, they had clumped together into an impenetrable clique of nice young folks who had exactly zero interest in getting to know the weird old fart from Texas showing up in their midst. For nine days and nights, I moved about in the shadowy fringes of their tight-knit little tribe as invisible, unnoticed, and irrelevant as any other little moth flitting about in the candlelight. I had some vague notion that some of them did something with macaws. Apparently, every eco-lodge in Latin America has some sort of token McCall researcher connected to it. Some were organic gardeners, and others helped out in the kitchen, or they were just back there scrounging between meal snacks. I was never quite sure. Just above the volunteers in seniority 
were the semi-transparent and Peruvian staffers who took care of all the usual stuff that needs to be taken care of. As with Manu Wildlife Center, not one paid staff member appeared to be native, though it's hard to tell sometime, particularly with the guys. And unlike Manu Wildlife Center, Manu Learning Center does not claim on its website that it hires native staff members. Clearly not native to the Amazon was Miguel, the guy who ran the show at Manu Learning Center, at least when the top dog, Joaquin Rivers, was not there to take the reins. I had actually met Miguel online months before when he had enthusiastically invited me to become part of the Crees team. The moment I stepped off the boat, Miguel, a slender, long-haired six-footer of perhaps 30 years old who looked more like a pretty boy glam rocker than the average Jose I had envisioned, wrapped me in a great bear hug like we were long-lost friends. Then, pretty much ignored me like everyone else did the entire time I was there. I never saw Miguel more than six feet from Joaquin's shadow, so I really can't draw any conclusions about the guy. When in the presence of Joaquin, which was all the time, however, Miguel was like John the Baptist tonguing at the hem of Jesus' garments. I mean, the dude worshipped Joaquin with the fidelity of a downy baby duck to its mama. I'm not suggesting that Miguel was a syncophant or Joaquin's lackey or yes-man. His idolatry of the mighty white boss from across the pond was more endearing than in any way pathetic. Joaquin had, quite simply, found the perfect man for the job. <clears throat> My taxonomy of Manu Learning Center's various residents was interrupted by the arrival of a quite tasty chicken soup. Not quite to the gourmet standards I had become accustomed to at Manu Wildlife Center, but still quite delicious. Of course, as ravenous as I was at that point, I would have been happy to walk outside and graze the tasty chicken broth calmed another fear of mine also. While I was 100% secure in the knowledge that the politically correct, rainforest-saving, tree-hugging Joaquin Rivers would not tolerate something so flatly unsustainable and downright evil as beef to be served, at the model of rainforest sustainability he was trying to create at his learning center, I wasn't so sure if he felt the same way about chicken and fish. You never know where those tria huggers are going to draw their arbitrary lines. By the time I had sucked down the appetizer, I was really ready for a serious plate of food. And I was not to be disappointed. One of the friendly young eco-tiers, as they were called, emerged from the kitchen bearing a plate with enough steaming spaghetti on it to choke a jaguar. She set it down in front of my face in the dim glow of the candle, made even dimmer by the fact I was not wearing my glasses. I dove into the lumpy red sauce with my fork, twirling the dripping pasta around the times in anticipation of the gustatory delight awaiting me. I stuck the overloaded fork into my mouth, and my tongue was set aglow with the absolutely delicious flavor of something I had not tasted in the year 2009. Beef. To say I was surprised or startled, or even astounded to discover my mouth full of beef at Manu Learning Center would not begin to do justice to Roger's thesaurus. 
I've been sitting here on the banks of the Mother of God for 20 minutes trying to finish this sentence. Finding beef on my tongue at the mother of all jungle eco-lodges was tantamount to finding, but there are no words that can convey not so much the despicable level of hypocrisy so much as the sheer tragic level of unconsciousness inherent in Joaquin's decision to serve beef at the poster child of Amazonian eco-lodges, I would have been no less flabbergasted to find beef on my plate at a Hindu temple in India. I noticed with some small relief that the young woman across the table, the green empowerment student who had been upset about the antifreeze incident, was staring at her plate as if she were looking at a steaming helping of fried McCall, which she was on some level. It's not your imagination, I whispered to her, reading her thoughts. As casually and politely as we could, we requested a vegetarian alternative and were, fortunately, granted one. After that first meal, I was branded as a vegetariano by the uncomprehending Peruvian staff and had to fight like a hungry jackal for every morsel of chicken, fish, or bacon I could scavenge. In all, eight vegetarianos came forward that evening, leaving a dozen eco-tears and green empowerment students not to mention the entire staff, including Miguel, and of course, including Joaquin, to divide the spoils of the cow carcass we had chosen to leave behind. <clears throat> As we ate, one of the green empowerment folks, between mouthfuls of beef, mentioned how the group had spotted a herd of peccaries on their walk down the hill from the broken-down bus. I mentioned, only half-joking, that I wish we were eating one of those wild pigs for dinner. That would be unsustainable, Joaquin chimed in, self-effacingly, it seemed to be, reminding me of Kurt Sita Racheta chiding me for eating a paca while stuffing her fat face with beef stroganoff. Make no mistake about this, guys. Joaquin Rivers, who I hope is reading this, is no Kurt Sita Racheta. Joaquin is a brilliant, sharp, perceptive, educated, aware, well-read, well-connected young man whose passion and commitment to saving the Amazon rainforest is both genuine and heartfelt, airport rumors notwithstanding. Rattling his sabers against overwhelming odds, he had sacrificed his time, energy, and I am guessing a shitload of dinero to hold the planet eaters back. The man is nobody's fool. He has got to know that beef cattle ranching as much is as if not more than big oil is responsible for more rainforest destruction in the Amazon than all the gold miners and palm oil farmers combined. Come on, Joaquin, wake the fuck up. Eat five grams of shrooms if you have to. Kriez could lead the rally to educate folks about one of the most senseless, needless slaughters going on on this planet. A half billion Hindus and one arrogant ex-realtor from Texas can't all be wrong. If I can stop eating beef, so can you. It starts with step one. My name is Joaquin, and I am a beef eater. 
Whenever you get the urge for a cheeseburger, and I know it's a tough addiction, I still lust after cheeseburgers, call me up and we'll work you through this addiction. After dinner, the spaghetti-sated Joaquin, holding court like Captain Kurtz in his remote jungle outpost, regaled us with a never-ending string of funny stories. Buried somewhere between battles against Hunt Oil in the Amazon and million-dollar deals with venture capitalists in New York, the rock tour told the brief tale of an eccentric neighbor who liked to crank up his heavy metal rock music on the stereo and blast the whole neighborhood. No matter what the neighbors tried to do or say to the guy to get him to change his ways, Nobody, including the ace negotiator himself, could convince the dude that what he was doing just simply is not cool. On the face of it, he was at wit's end with the guy. Said the frustrated Joaquin, wrapping up his story, when somebody just fundamentally does not get something, there is nothing you can do or say to them to get them to change their mind. What better pearls of wisdom I thought to myself to cogitate upon the night before my six-month anniversary of fomenting a planet-wide revolution in consciousness to save the world, Nobody said goodnight to me because nobody noticed the invisible man getting up and leaving to call it a night at 9 p.m. on Saturday night on the 4th of July. The sound of Joaquin's laughing voice followed me across the clearing and halfway up the stairs to my bed where I was mercifully rescued by the lullaby of raindrops on the palm roof and the gentle gurgle of a small waterfall somewhere off in the forest behind me. And that will wrap up chapter 21 and bring us to chapter 22, Seeds of Doubt. Coming right up. My gosh.